about upcoming events at the museum. Uh, this Friday, we'll be having our third on third lecture for this month. This month's speaker is Dr. John Bryan, who will be telling us about the voyage of the slave ship, the Antelope, which was captured off the coast of Florida in about 1820. Um, on September 6th at noon, we'll be holding our next brown bag lunch. Our speakers for next month will be Phil Neiman, here in the room with us, and Dave Roser, who will be telling us about the history of the U.S. Coast Guard in the 20th century, as well as their personal experiences as Coast Guard servicemen. Going along with that, the museum's excited to announce that it's resuming its Veterans History Oral History Project. This project, which the museum does in partnership with the Library of Congress, collects the stories of veterans who live in or lived in Nassau County. If you are interested in participating or know someone who may be, uh, please get in contact with me after the program or shoot me an email. My contact information is on the back table there. I won't take up too much more of your time, so I'm going to turn it over to Sal. Thank you all so much for coming today and enjoy. <laughs> oh. watching me. Yes. Hi <laughs> there. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sal Camella. I'm the city's historic preservation planner. Um, we're very happy to be presenting this tonight. One of our goals for the year is really preservation education. Um, so we are very happy to have Dr. Williams travel here to be with us tonight. Um, I'll give you a little bit about him. Um, Dr. Williams is chair of the Architectural History Program uh, at Savannah College of Art and Design, specializing in the history of modern architecture and cities. He holds a PhD in art history from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, his dissertation was on urban transformation of 19th century Rome. Since joining SCAD in 1993, <coughs> Williams has focused his research on Savannah, authoring Buildings of Savannah in 2016. Um, it looks like he's uh, co-authoring an upcoming book um, to be published by the University of Georgia Press on the evolution of Savannah's urban plan and its impact on the city's architecture. Separately, he has researched and published on the evolution of historic street and sidewalk pavement across North America for the past 15 years. So I'm proud to present to you tonight, Dr. Robin B. Williams, how historic pavements contribute to a sense of place. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation, Sal. It's always a pleasure to talk about street pavement, which is, um, started as a very niche topic, uh, and even today, I think I'm the only architectural historian in the country who is really focusing on this topic, and the history of cities is dominated by history of buildings, and something you'll hear me talk about is how the, the way in which uh, cities as historic repositories of historic resources that historians often have blinkers on and only focus, tend to focus on the buildings and ignore everything else, and, or at least uh, don't give it as much attention as it's due. So this is part of my ongoing argument, and it's one that's ongoing in Savannah, where you would think, as you'll see, Savannah is awash in historic resources, and even there, it's an uphill battle to get them to appreciate things beyond the buildings. So my title asks how historic pavements can contribute to a sense of place. And this phrase, a sense of place, is one that is very popular these days, used by preservationists and planners and architects and cultural and landscape historians to uh, make a case that, we, that our world, which is increasingly becoming generic, dominated by asphalt, automobile-related, fast food and such, is not the built environment that we aspire to, but rather we long, and Amelia Island and Fernandina Beach, obviously, just walking up and down Center Street this afternoon, it's obvious this has a strong sense of place, and you obviously have a lot of visitors, as does Savannah, as does Savannah, and, um, but these are both Savannah, and I think it's easy to forget that once you get out of the historic districts of Savannah and you cross a couple of south of the downtown, you cross into the post-war suburbs, 
where if it weren't for this little word Savannah up here, you could be anywhere. And in fact, it's very telling that the Hyundai dealership has to put the city you're in. You know, you don't see the word Savannah on Jones Street because you know you're in Savannah. So what is the sense of place in Fernandina Beach? Well, it obviously has a very deep and storied history that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Its urban form of uh, grid plans both date to both the British in the 18th century and then the Spanish when they reacquired uh, Fernandina uh, and applied the laws of the Indies in the early 19th century. And I was reading online that this was the very last place that the Spanish applied those laws. It was sort of like a rule book for city building that started in the 16th century and obviously carried up into the early 19th century. And that is for this little section to the north of the area where we are. And then in the mid 18th century, mid 19th century, a railroad developer laid out Fernandina that we know today and carried on the tradition of the grid plan at a slightly larger scale. But the grid is its own sense of identity. It's a very American um, urban planning form, although it is one we can certainly trace its history back to ancient Roman castrum plans, the kind of military encampments. Even the Greeks before that used grid plans. So the grid as a town planning tradition has about 2,500 years of tradition behind it to which cities like Fernandina Beach belong. But when I say it's American, I'd say there are more gridded towns in America than any other country. So it is, in, the developer of the modern part of Fernandina um, was part of a wave, uh, especially associated with the railroads. If you go to the American West, almost every railroad town is laid out on a grid. The sense of place is obviously defined heavily by its architecture, and there are some wonderful examples. I was sweating out there this afternoon with my camera <laughs> and really enjoyed finding the ice cream shop. My wife and I, my wife would dart into the shops and I would be outside shooting pavement and buildings and uh, it was very, very warm. Uh, and it was really delightful to see buildings in person. It's sort of like meeting someone, an old friend at a cocktail party. I've gotten to know Fernandina Beach through the internet over the past week and and then walk, he's like, I know you, and I know you. <laughs> and these buildings have become old friends. And so it's really been a pleasure discovering your town. And also learning about this 2018 historic Be uh, Fernandina Beach Historic Resources survey done in 2018 by a firm, Brockington Cultural Resources Consulting, that has offices all over the place, including Savannah. And they did a survey to help the city of Fernandina Beach figure out what's important. And these kind of surveys are important for historic preservation departments and city planning departments. But I thought it was very telling that as comprehensive as this is, it never mentions one thing, not even in the transportation category, does it mention one thing about anything but buildings. Not one word is, not one little iota of ink is spilled about the, any of the things you see in these pictures, from the vestiges of vitrified brick pavement that have been repurposed as crosswalks on Center Street, to the hex, hexagonal concrete pavers, to the, uh, which used to be more extensive, and I'm sure you all know the Palace Saloon, which had those pavers and a street sign by it, and one of the many street signs that survive around the town. But when we just, just to think about a street, what, uh, com what constitutes a street is much more than what people think of as a street. And I love to challenge my students and say, okay, where is the edge of the street? And most of them will point to a curb. But technically, the edge of a building, the property line, to the edge of another building, the other property line, is the street. And everything that is public property between two property lines is the street corridor. If you go back through historic maps, like the ones I was showing you in front of the beach, it doesn't show sidewalks, it doesn't show gutters, it just shows property line to property line. Those are the streets. And they're usually on maps, they'll tell you how wide they are. And what happens between those walls of the property lines evolves through time. Curbs can move, street pavements can change, new infrastructure could be added, 
For example, does Fernandina Beach have uh, fiber optic cable? It may, it may not, but that's a new utility, new technology that some cities are installing. Just like telephone, electricity, sewers were installed in, in bef before. Are there embedded signage or plaques? Or, there are street signs, obviously. And some of the other things that you might find in the historic city, certainly in Savannah, I've seen them in others, uh, carriage stones, even manhole covers can be historic. And I remember um, seeing someone post on, on a, I forget where I saw it on the internet, but someone posted that there's this 1860s manhole cover in New York City, oldest manhole cover in New York. And then I reply, replied with a photo of an 1848 manhole cover in Savannah and say, yeah, but ours is older. <laughs> so, um, and although Fernandina Beach is probably too small and I'm giving the sea level, I don't think there are any basements here. Is that a safe bet? Yeah. No basements. Yeah. <laughs> downtown Savannah is 40 feet above sea level, so we have basements in downtown. Um, New York has a lot bigger cities. Prismatic vault lights are these prism, prisms of glass. If you've ever been to Soho in New York, they're sidewalks of glass that allow light to get into basements and extend out from under a shop into the public realm. And they illuminated them before electricity with glass in the sidewalk. Lots of cities have these surviving. In Oregon, Portland, Oregon, it's the only city I've found that has horse rings embedded into their curves so they could bend down and lash up their horses why they put them way down at the curb as opposed to a post like a normal city, but that's... And then bollards, which are those protective things that's, that originated as cannon barrels and then other materials were used to protect buildings, not to mention any number of landscape elements. And this is just a street, not to mention historic resources. It might be parks and cemeteries and uh, monuments, which none of which were mentioned in that report. I did find online this 1985 historic district map, and what I found remarkable, given the other more recent report, I'm sorry it's fuzzy, but I couldn't get a high resolution version of this, but in the little legend here, it mentions the usual contributing and non-contributing buildings, but it added brick, which you can see at the crosswalks, but also a stretch of Center Street running up to 10th, from about 8 to 10th. Center Street, or maybe it was Atlantic by that point, uh, was a brick street still in 1985, and the hexagonal paving um, sidewalks are marked in various places, and it appears, from what I hear, my visit maybe, uh, hopefully might have an impact on their fate, I don't know, but uh, they are certainly a character-defining feature of the built environment here, and it also noted, though it's really hard to see where they are, a granite curbing, of which there's a fair amount on Center Street at least. So there was a, at least one documentation of a recognition, a much more holistic approach. But this focus on buildings, this um, obsession with focusing on buildings, is not unique to Fernandina Beach. Even Savannah, with its much larger and celebrated um, downtown National Historic Landmark District, where I have served on um, a commission, the Historic District Review Board, that regulates all of this. I served on it for six years, so I'm intimately familiar with this. All the purple that you see on the map are the contributing, what used to be called contributing structures. They've renamed recently the whole map from an historic building map to a contributing resources map. So that sounds promising, except it's still about buildings. It doesn't say anything. Uh, they upgraded the legend, but they, the, the, how they framed it, but it's still just about buildings. And I've been lobbying um, long and hard for about 15, almost 15 years now for the city to start protecting its various pavements. And even the squares, the thing for which Savannah is most famous, the squares are not protected. Buildings are protected. The squares, in theory, the city could drive a street. Or it, you, in fact, three of them... Um, right, let's see, there and there. The, uh, there used to be two more squares like that one, and they have a road going through them since 1935. So theoretically, the <coughs> squares could have that happen again, although I think that's highly unlikely. So the sense of place 
officially is defined by the buildings, but the reality is, and this is a more touristic website on Savannah, and it's interesting how they draw attention. They start with one of the most beautiful cities in the world with cobblestone streets, gardens, oak-shaded parks, and Spanish moss. Um, you know, it's interesting. They don't mention anything about the buildings, although there is a picture of one. And uh, yes, Savannah has great buildings. But its built environment is more than just its buildings. It's the brick sidewalks, the slate curves, the granite curves, the trees, the landscaping are all part of the equation in Savannah. And in fact, the squares, of course, um, are an essential part of Savannah's identity. It's waterfront with the combination of the warehouses as architecture, but River Street as this Belgian block corridor restored in the 1970s um, that fronts, then there's some plazas that were part of that renewal project. But I don't think anyone would want to see the Belgian blocks disappear. They're as important to the identity of the River Street, to the waterfront, as are these wonderful old warehouses. And so I've been to Savannah 30 years. Um, it's a place that I came to teach at SCAD, and the uh, it didn't take long to take notice of the various different kinds of pavement. And in fact, it was this middle one up here that caught my eye, is right out in front of the building I was teaching in, in downtown Savannah. And you can see the corner of a triangle. It piqued my interest why the bricks turned into a shape of a triangle. And that puzzle led me to start digging into researching pavement. And then I started looking and realizing, wow, there are a lot of different kinds of pavement in Savannah. Some of them quite old, some of them pretending to be old. This is from the 1950s. It's oyster shell concrete, which is not tabby. Um, it's modern concrete, and they threw oyster shells as aggregate to make it look like tabby, but tabby was never a pavement. So it's kind of an, an anachronistic pavement, I guess you could say. And then these stamped concrete looking like cobblestones and then these um, granite sets, which look like Europe, but were never part of Savannah's historic identity. And then some historic pavements, including ones that you would recognize. We have them too, those hexagonal blocks, pavers. So my interest in pavement inspired me to dig into it as an academic topic. I gave the, a presentation at a conference almost as a, as a whim, as a, I don't know, as a kind of conference where you um, it's a regional one, very welcoming, experimental topics. And I did it almost as a, I don't know, it's, it's sort of like being a cook and you experiment with something you don't really, you wouldn't serve as a serious meal, you're just kind of experimenting. And that's how this topic was for me. I gave the paper and a colleague said, Robin, that's the best thing I've heard you do. It's like, oh, really? <laughs> I don't know what that says about my ability to talk about a building, but anyway, they thought it was fresh, it was different. They had never heard anyone talk about pavement. And so I was invited to write a paper about it, which I published, a journal article 10 years ago. And I started, but it was only about Savannah and the article. And, um, but a, a colleague, read it and and who was up in chicago and he was very complimentary and he said so how does savannah compare to the rest of the country you know you really should carry on with this project and go elsewhere and and I, and i was curious to know to what extent is savannah representative surely other cities have old pavements too and so i did i started looking at other southern historic cities that are even more famous for their historic preservation, since Charleston, South Carolina, and New Orleans are the pioneering cities from the 1920s in the realm of historic preservation. Savannah was a bit of a Johnny-come-lately in the 1950s. Uh, but the three are the most celebrated southern cities, famous for their historic preservation in terms of their historic districts, their buildings, their identities. And yet, Charleston, Savannah, and Charleston and New Orleans have saved almost none of their historic pavements by comparison to Savannah. And each color is a different kind of pavement. So Savannah's got not only a nice concentration with the waterfront being a heavy concentration, 
and you can make out some of the squares, still historic <coughs> pavements. But it's quite extensive compared to those. And it's like, well, that's interesting. Not what I expected. And so I started traveling and visiting other cities, sometimes with support from my college, sometimes just independent travel uh, with my wife, who's always helping me out and is a good trooper, um, <laughs> my research assistant. And uh, so uh, we've, uh, some of these I've done on my own, some with her, but we've traveled around the continent, including a, a trip down to Florida some years ago with our son, and because uh, I have to say, when you're studying the history of cities and you're thinking, okay, what cities are going to have the most intact historic resources? Florida is not the first place you think of. And yet Florida, especially St. Petersburg and Tampa, have the most extensive preservation of brick streets in the country. So, and then Columbus, Ohio, has pretty good. And um, Savannah has the greatest diversity of pavements, but just for sheer quantity, I think St. Per Petersburg takes the prize. Um, but what I discovered also, in because I don't just visit cities, I go into archives, and I hunt down these things, which are pavement maps, historic pavement maps, and part of my interest in Savannah grew out of having discovered this one. This is the legend. It's, they're very colorful maps, and just think of a street map but looking a bit like a Mondrian painting with all the different colors forming a kind of grid. And that tradition, I thought, wow, that's a really pretty map. And then I discovered another one, and then another one. I've since found them for about 20 different cities. These are the cities with the most variety. Philadelphia, Toronto, and Savannah, Detroit, each having about 10 to 12 different kinds of pavement at one time usually around the early 20th century, and the one from Savannah is 1907, and this one, Minneapolis, and you can see how regional it is with cypress and cedar wood here. Um, let's see, in uh, an industrial city like Philadelphia, they have iron slag blocks and um, granolithic concrete, and, and then Savannah has, um, where to go. Oyster, they just got shell. Well, that's oyster shell. So some very regional things um, from one place to another, yet there's all this variety. And then I found this publication in Chicago in my research, and it was, um, it's called The Street Paving Problem of Chicago was the publication. And what I discovered, to my delight, were pages of these diagrams, many pages, like 40 cities, documented, and every one of them had a different combination of pavements. So this is pretty representative. And you can see Milwaukee, mostly macadam, Detroit, mostly wooden block, Cleveland, sort of half brick, half so-called other kinds, St. Paul is a good variety, Kansas City was mostly asphalt, and uh, Baltimore was mostly cobblestone. So you can see each city took a different approach to solving the pavement problem. And all of this because asphalt that we know, this modern synthetic asphalt, that's cheap, relatively easy to lay down, smooth, not so durable, but you know, it lasts maybe 10 to 15 years, um, hadn't been developed yet. Na asphalt back then was natural asphalt that had to be harvested from Trinidad, so by hand, and was really expensive because then it had to be shipped to New York to be processed and then shipped to your city. So by the time it got to, your, to Kansas City, it was the most expensive paper. So the expense or readily, you know, what is your budget? How close are you to a, a pavement resource? Port cities like Baltimore have ships coming in laden with cobblestones. So cobblestone was very common on port cities, but in the Midwest, no cobblestones, because they're far from the coast. So the, what is available to you had a lot to do with where you're geographically located, what your budget was, what your local preferences were. And just a, to give you visual, help you visualize some of these pavements, some of which survive. Uh, macadam basically looks like gravel, so it's hard to know if I'm looking at a macadam road or just a gravel road, uh, but that was a kind of regulated, consistent gravel. Cobblestones, I think you all are familiar. It's funny, the word cobblestone 
is a catch-all phrase, whether it's brick, granite block, rounded natural stones, or Belgian blocks, people like, they just like to call them cobblestones. But technically, cobblestones are natural, rounded stones. Highly irregular, geologically can be from all over the world. In Savannah, there's one, one cobblestone that was saved, you know, one of the ramps where the stones were removed. The uh, stones, there's this one stone that had Chinese characters engraved into it, and the date 8, 1797 mm. in Chinese marked as the third year of a certain emperor who came to power in 1794 or 1795. And so we know the date of the stone based on the inscription. And it came from China. So cobblestones were part of the global trade network. Ships loaded stones from a port, and if they filled up with cotton like they would in Savannah, they didn't need as many stones for ballast, so they dumped their stones on the wharf. So ports were constantly dumping and acquiring new ballast, but ports that were mainly export ports, like Savannah, were getting stones coming in and cotton going in. So a lot of streets in Savannah were paved with cobblestones, as were other American ports. Oyster shells, there's one street in Savannah that still has oyster shells. Plank roads, I've just, my wife and I just traveled south from Toronto over the past few days, and it's interesting how often we stop somewhere and it just says Plank Road as the name of a road in a place. It's a very common, there were thousands of miles of Plank Roads in America in the 1850s. As far as I know, none of them survive. But there are some woodblock pavements in a handful of cities around the continent and Belgian blocks, which are pretty common and were the heavy duty pavements of industrial areas. And those were all the sort of natural material pre-mid-19th century, or that had appeared by the mid-19th century. Second half of the 19th century, what you might call more industrial modern pavements, industri industrially produced pavements from asphalt, vitrified bricks, asphalt blocks. Uh, and by the way, this is a natural sheet asphalt. Pennsylvania Avenue was one of the first streets in America to be so paved around 1870. Uh, one of my favorite pavements, because it's so pretty, is this, it has, looks like it has a blue glaze, and it's called Scoria or Iron Slag. And I've only found it in two cities, in Philadelphia and Toronto. And uh, I've never been to San Juan, Puerto Rico, but I've seen pictures of it, it's gorgeous. It's, it's almost iridescent blues. Wish we had more of it. And then concrete with irregular granite, mm -hmm. aggregate, like aggregate the size of your fist, and then what you see out in the sidewalks in this town, um, granitoid, which is, um, came in in the, in, the in the 20th century. So how about Fernandina Beach's pavement story? Well, like every American city, it started out with dirt streets, and the first part of the built environment to get paved would be the sidewalks. And it's really hard to know without doing deeper research what these sidewalks were made out of. Were they made out of concrete? Were they made out of uh, packed oyster shells, were they uh, wood, it, like there are some wood planks here, but it's kind of hard to see what they are here, but I find it fascinating that there must have been some really deep gutters to have these bridges, and drainage was, like in Savannah, always an issue in southern cities, and railway tracks, or streetcar tracks, electricity, so this is late 19th century in these photos, this one's 1907, still some dirt streets, but at some point, these look like 1940s, 50s, 40s cars. So by the 1930s, probably, like most of the other Florida cities had this kind of pavement by the 1930s and carried on paving with vitrified brick longer than other parts of the country. Uh, I think Tampa and St. Petersburg were still paving with brick into the 1940s, which most other cities stopped in the 1920s. So um, there was a time, and so I understand from Sal that this is, I've been confused by the nomenclature that I thought this, oh, that's Atlantic, but wait, it's at third, hold on. But so this is center, that was center, then Atlantic, then it went back to being called center. So that's center and third, despite what it says. And um, it, uh, judging from the bricks that survive, red, 
what's called vitrified brick, which is a type of brick that was discovered by accident in the other Charleston, Charleston, West Virginia, where they overcooked a batch of bricks. So in firing them, they started vitrifying. So they cooked them too long and too hot, and a clay brick, which you like the bricks right by, uh, sorry, Jarrett, yes, Jarrett. Uh, these kind of bricks are hard pressed, normal building bricks, but these still aren't strong enough to be paving bricks. So to be paving bricks, they have to be fired longer and hotter, and uh, that process of vitrification they means that this kind of clay, and they discovered when it has a higher shale content, the brick can actually start turning the glass. It vitrifies, it becomes very dense, very hard, and impervious to, pay, to, to liquids. And in the days of horses peeing on your streets, impervious pavements was definitely a plus. So, because, think about wood. Wood was like a sponge. Uh, asphalt was like a sponge. So these other pavements, and if you've ever walked, I mean, Savannah still has horse-drawn carriages, and just one horse peeing in the street is a quite fragrant affair. Um, <laughs> I can't imagine what New York must have smelled like when they had 10,000 horses at any given time in Manhattan. And they would just drop dead in the street, and they'd have guys whose whole job it was was to collect the dead animals out of the street. So vitrified brick is the most common historic pavement that I've discovered in my many travels documenting cities. And in fact, as I mentioned, Florida has some of the best preserved stretches of streets. Um, these are the four Florida cities that I had previously documented. And St. Petersburg uh, probably has the most. Tampa has a generous number. St. Augustine, it's a lot smaller, so not so many. The big surprise, because I only know Orlando for its music parks. I didn't. I had no idea Orlando had so many historic brick streets, and uh, so that was refreshing. So there was, as I mentioned, this couple block long stretch of historic pavement intact, evidently in 1985. Those bricks um, happily have been at least repurposed as crosswalks, although. Um, as you'll hear me talk about, other cities have been motivated to go back and put brick streets in. So the other, another key defining key, uh, feature of the built environment in um, here is obviously the hexagonal uh, concrete paver sidewalks, which are perhaps m most impressive in front of the old county courthouse. And as I was doing my research for this talk, I discovered they were all around the Palace Saloon down near the foot of Center Street. Um, this is what City Hall used to look like. Same building buried under a lot of modern transformations. Is that where you work? Okay. And uh, it used to have, you can barely make them out, but there are those telltale patterns of light and dark and uh, even one of the street signs. And this shows that they were there by 1945. And you mentioned that they are from the very early 20th century. We're not sure, but we, we think in some photographs they show up. Yeah, so in other places, and here is a particularly, this is fresh off the camera. Uh, that's like <laughs> two hours old as a photo. Um, so whenever I visit a place, I bring my camera, I have a little archeological ruler and I measure them. I found uh, hex blocks, I wanna say of four different sizes or three different hex sizes and then one octagon, octagonal, like that used to be in front of First Presbyterian Church. This is what I was able to find online that has since been replaced by hex blocks. But uh, online, you can only notice so much. And in my um, explorations this afternoon, I discovered this set of pavement uh, on, I guess this is center, no, it's Atlantic and 8th. I think, or ninth? Ninth. Ninth. Okay, Atlantic and Ninth. Uh, the gentleman who was sitting on the porch was very suspicious. He was, I could tell he was on his phone. He kept looking up and following me as I was walking back and forth in front of his house. Um, but this kind of pavement uh, that I've, this was the only photo I could find online, is this sort of generic one. I have never seen this pavement before. 
with the octagon and the square. And this is the arguably the only surviving, now I haven't been to every American city, but I've been to a lot of American cities, over 50 of them documenting pavement. And uh, as uh, you'll show you here, um, I'll come to this in just a second, but let me just say that the octagon and square pattern I've never seen before. So if that's something worth at least keeping some of this intact, maybe the part along 9th Street there. I know that the stretch over by the fellow's driveway is pretty beat up, but worthy of consideration for its preservation. Uh, other cities have taken hex paver preservation as a battle cry. In fact, in the neighborhood of Old Northeast, the entry sign and their little neighborhood flags are all about the hex pavers. And they are proud of them, they are preserving them, they are restoring them, some of them are in bad shape, and they're, this is a product that's still being produced. In fact, in Tampa, in the Ybor City District, they have repaved them. There is a company called Carol's Building Materials that produces them. Here they are, piled up. They can, and these, they did a campaign uh, 33 years ago to help subsidize, I thought this might be something to consider, is maybe you subsidize the restoration of your sidewalks with this kind of campaign. As you can see back, well this is, I don't know how old this price point was, but pavers are 175 each. A money order, check, cash, or PayPal <laughs> must be received at the Eber City CRA. So uh, they call it their walk of fame, and as you walk along, you can see these, um, these uh, inscriptions, but Tampa has, St. Petersburg has more of them, but Tampa has this fascinating pattern. But they didn't stop there. They're extending the pavers into parts of the city that never had them. Out East Street, east of their historic, like look at the surroundings. This is not downtown Eber City. This is blocks to the east. And uh, it's interesting how they talk about wider sidewalks created with the iconic black and white hexagon pavers. I mean, they are, Especially there, they have this sort of meandering, almost serpentine pattern of laying them in Tampa, as opposed to the more, um, as you can see here, and here you can see some of the inscriptions, as opposed to the more floral motif pattern that is popular, that's the basis for their flag in St. Petersburg. So the patterns even are local in how they are laid. And even Atlanta, um, this has been a bit of a, Atlanta, the pavers are, I mean, they're, it's interesting, there's this Reddit post I noticed last night about the terrible shape of pavers in Atlanta. And people didn't hold back. They, some people truly hate these things, but look at their condition. So what they did is they pillaged them from one sidewalk where they're able to salvage all the good ones and fix, this is, you can see, note the wooden fence. This is the same sidewalk before and after. So they took pavers from one place and consolidated the historic pavers to make at least one stretch of sidewalk. So this is another solution where you can have historic pavers where in one place. And I noticed here that you've got stamped uh, hex pavement as a solution as well, though not quite as authentic um, as a solution. The only other two cities I've found them in are St. Paul, Minnesota, and Savannah. That's it. Six cities, hex pavers. There, I'm sure there are more, but I am pretty thorough in my investigations, and you can Google hex pavers, and you'll mostly end up at my website, um, <laughs> where I've been documenting them. Uh, the other material, historic curbs. Uh, you have curbs that sort of range like these ones, granite curbs. Other cities have other materials, but granite is by far the most common historic paving, curbing material, and uh, most cities, and no matter what you try, nothing is, an, is as durable as a granite curb. Uh, and in fact, Savannah has started putting in granite curbs where they used to be concrete. They're more expensive, and other cities have been doing this too. You can have them, and the, ones, the new ones in Savannah look like this, really rustic. Uh, some cities have them, and they're very machined. So there are lots of different ways of doing it, but other historic materials were used for curbs. 
And of course, you've got the street signs. Oh, sorry, my little bubble should be over there. Never mind, that's the, the sign. Phantom bubble. Anyway, I don't know what's doing, but you've got your signs. I apologize for the quality. I was out shooting my own photos, but these are Google Street View. I know you're all familiar with these. And um, I trust you're proud of them. They're distinctive. I've never seen signs quite like these. I mean, it's interesting. This is a tradition that other cities have done as well. In fact, concrete street signs were evidently common in the first half of the 20th century. A few cities, Savannah, as you'll see, has quite a few. Houston has a handful. Grace Lake, Illinois has these green ones. And these ones in Illinois, are these are suburbs of Chicago, has these ones with plaques screwed onto them. And I've long been trying to figure out when they date from and using historic photos. So the oldest photo in Savannah that I've been able to figure out is the 1920s. So when you said pre-1904, I was like, whoa, I got to see that photo documentation. So, because this is the earliest article I've found about concrete signposts is about 1920. So somewhere in the early 20th century, this tradition of some have plaques, some have stenciled paintings, uh, wording, some have them engraved, like when they pour the concrete into a mold, they've got the letters that are inscribed in Savannah, that's how they are, and then they paint them white and pick out the inscribed ones. Um, but because this one's about 150 feet from my house, I uh, became fascinated with them and started noticing them around Savannah. And this is a more recent project and just started putting them into a Google map. And then I put a thing on my Hist Friends of Historic Pavement Facebook group, which you're certainly welcome to join. So there is a Friends of Historic Pavement Facebook group, which social networking turns out is a great way to do research. I put a general post, let me know if you know of any signs. So I did crowdsourcing. And in fact, all the black ones are intact in their original location. All the red ones survive, but have been moved, corralled into other places. And so some are here. These are the moving spots. So like there's a whole bunch there and there's a big crowd of them there. The city just rips them out and parks them in a row like fence posts. And then someone said, yeah, about an hour north of Savannah, there are four of them along a rural highway. It's like, what? And so we were out traveling and went specifically to that spot. And sure enough, there are four Savannah street signs out in the countryside. That's crowdsourcing for you. Uh, and then the yellow ones are lost based on photographic documentation where I see a historic photograph of buildings. Like, oh, look at the street sign. So as you can see, I've been able to identify all, including the lost ones, over 500 signs. About 300 and something survive in Savannah. And uh, these are the older ones. And then the, around the outer suburbs, because they're farther out, I presume they're more recent, are ones a little bit more like yours with stenciled lettering on them, but much different proportions. And you can see yours with their chamfered corners and little flared base and their squat, shorter proportions are different from any of the others. So they're unique. They are, there, no other city has these concrete, I call them obelisks, quite like yours. And something that you might consider doing in this community is more crowdsourcing. So I put out a call, does anyone have historic photos of signs? And I, people sent me these. It was a thing in Savannah that people would take a family photo leaning up against a street sign or taking refuge in a flood uh, on a street sign. So, um, you know, they're part of the, the sense of, obviously, sense of place, right? This is important to Savannahans. And they also record changes in street names. West Broad is now MLK in Savannah. Uh, as you can see, Spruce Street doesn't exist anymore, nor does uh, Lumber Street. The curbs do. The Savannah loves leaving vestiges of old things and just sort of say, ah, why put in the effort to remove the sign? Just leave it. So I love it because it tells a story. And some communities have actually been making efforts to preserve their signs. So this brings us back to Fernandina Beach and a, an ordinance that is going to be, have they voted on it? No, it's actually been moved to next month. Okay, so, um, and 
I think this is fantastic. You're farther ahead than Savannah. Since I, this is exactly what I've been lobbying for to happen in Savannah, is an ordinance for the protection, maintenance, and preservation of historic streetscape elements. Buildings are protected. Streetscape elements are not. But Fernambina Beach would join a venerable tradition that goes back to the 1980s of, of historic cities in the South being the pioneers in establishing policies or rather ordinances in Wilmington, North Carolina, it's the oldest I've seen, as a, an ordinance. But policy in Wilmington means ordinance. So whereas in Savannah, policy means, yeah, you might follow it, but you're not obliged to. In Savannah, we use the word ordinance if it's legally binding policy, isn't it? Not in Wilmington. So this is an ordinance. Uh, St. Petersburg, a few years later, uh, started protecting its streets and then it's curbs, and then it's sidewalks. So little by little, they kept expanding their protection, including their hex block sidewalks, which date to 1914 in St. Petersburg. So yours are probably about the same age. And then Tampa follows suit a few years later and includes bricks, streets in their city. And then finally, a city a little farther north caught up and went way beyond any other city so to my knowledge, and one that you might review, and the one I point Savannah officials to as sort of the Cadillac of uh, street, sidewalk, curb, and other historic feature protection is Baltimore's ordinance, is the most comprehensive. So I noticed in the wording of the ordinance that there's a need to do a GIS survey, which I have been spearheading in Savannah. And so, um, Sometimes I'm the one out there doing it myself. Sometimes uh, this is one, a neater one from a student who had a tablet. It's like, oh, that's a good idea, using a tablet. I was doing, I'm an old pen and paper kind of guy, so that's mine. But what we use is an historic cadastral map, just, just a map that has an accurate, in fact, the 1930s, all of Savannah's blocks, streets, and pavements were recorded by, as a WPA project in the 1930s. So it made a perfect, base map where some of those pavements are still there and um, we updated them and they made a great base map. So, you, And then that got put into a GIS database and one of the big challenges is how do you represent street pavement from bricks, from sidewalk pavement, from curbs, color coded and so the thin line, so just areas mapped out as street pavement uh, we decided not to do that with the sidewalk pavement just because it would get very confusing. So we used this pattern of dotted lines for sidewalks and then curbs are the solid thin lines. And black is granite, blue is slate. So sometimes Savannah has parallel curbs. And then, so the, whether the student or I did the original uh, survey, it gets put in and then I take that, print it out and I walk the streets and I do and shockingly, maybe not so shockingly, there were corrections needed. And so this is a representative, that's that sheet with the corrections that needed to be input, which I had a subsequent intern input. <laughs> it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> this is a serious project. Um, but if you do it, just make sure that you have built into it a, a double checking mechanism. So you do it and then go back and double check it. And in the end, this is sort of a, just a viewing out. It's, it's not public, but there's a data layer in the cities down, for the whole downtown district. It took years, multiple interns. Um, so uh, yeah, unlike yours, which is tied to an ordinance, the advice I got from the Savannah's preservation officer at the time was, well, let's do the survey first and make a case. And one of the things, the advantages of GIS survey, not only can you keep track of its maintenance, but also you can quantify, like for example, Savannah has, um, this is the curbing, 1,490, this is just downtown, um, the equivalent, these are linear feet, so 154,000 linear feet of granite curbs, I forget how many miles that is, it's miles and miles of granite curbs, and historic pavement, historic sidewalks. As I mentioned, Savannah has a lot of variety of historic materials, and we included them modern ones too. 
But in addition to all that, um, it dawned on me that other historic features needed. So we went back into the GIS and I hired and got another intern to just walk the downtown core looking only for manhole covers. <laughs> and any other oddball plaques that she might find. So these are her pages where she gave each one its own code so that she could just put a code number on a map. And then we had this as our sort of key for like Kehoe Ironworks 1 and the Kehoe Ironworks 2 and so on and so forth. But in my travels, uh, there are other things that I've stumbled upon that just fascinate me. And I mentioned the rings in Portland, stepping stones. These are the prismatic vault lights, which turn purple with age because they have, oh, I'm blanking on the uh, mineral that's in them that turns purple with UV light. Uh, it'll come to me eventually. New Orleans is one of four cities that found these blue and white tiles for their street names. And in Detroit, from 1914, a German immigrant named Kriegoff embrace the swastika as his corporate symbol, acme quality it says, um, and people come along in Detroit and once they find them they try to chisel them out of the sidewalk, so I'm glad I found that one unharmed. But does this city have any historic concrete? Are there what are called contractor stamps? Are there any stepping stones? I, you wouldn't have these, but you know there are other things that might be. I only went up and down Center Street, which obviously had a big redo in the 1970s, but I, there might be things out there that are worthy of uh, protection. And historic signage, be it highly vernacular, Bradley's is this really old key shop, and out in the sidewalk they've embedded keys into the, con into, literally into the sidewalk. And this was a hex tile sign that uh, a, a municipal a uh, crew was supposed to replace the concrete all around it, and they unwittingly destroyed it. They didn't like the word Dixie, they thought it was bad, so they jackhammered that out of the sidewalk, even though it was historic, but it wasn't protected. And, uh, but Savannah, this is not Savannah, but Savannah does protect historic signage, even when it's on private property like terrazzo signage. So if you have any of that, for example. So speaking of brick streets and um, cities that not only are recording and protecting, Wilmington was the first with a protective ordinance, but they've gone further in starting to identify where there are stretches of historic bricks under asphalt. And I noticed at Atlantic and about 9th, there is a little pothole, like a little patch of bricks under some asphalt. So it's entirely possible you have some bricks hiding under some asphalt. Savannah certainly does. And in other places, they've got modern brick, um, like along here. So some cities have actually been going back and putting in new brick pavement. Or you can do as Orlando does. If you find bricks under asphalt, as Orlando has been doing, you can borrow their machine, and, which uses 12 million BTUs to warm up the asphalt giant toaster, then come along with a, a bulldozer basically, and plow the asphalt off, and then get a crew to sort of scrub it a bit, and believe it or not, this used to be covered with asphalt. And so I went to Tampa, skeptical that it really could look that good, or sorry, Orlando, and, but if you notice, these bricks have all sorts of irregularities in them. These are the original brick streets. They did take off the asphalt, pick up the bricks and relay them. They just cleaned off the asphalt. Look at these streets. I was astounded how, how there's no trace of the asphalt. I don't know how much it costs, but they're committed to doing a lot of this in Orlando. And I am committed to convincing Savannians to do the same, even when it's like eight inches of asphalt. Um, on top of Whitaker Street, for example, which has bricks, sometimes under only like half an inch of asphalt, sometimes under a ton of asphalt, but uh, you might have that too. So what are your opportunities? Obviously the ordinance is meant to protect, preserve, maintain, but something that, as I hope to sh I showed with Ebro City, the possibility that maybe these, maybe there could come a time when Maybe the owner of this shop would say, you know what, 
I want to go back to, you know, incentivize the bringing back more of these as part of your local identity. And obviously these street signs, um, which uh, used to be more frequent, including the one at, I think this is second, center and second. There used to be one there. So I understand that the hex sidewalks are, hex pavers are threatened. Um, possibly will all be removed, or at least some of them will be removed. And if my presentation has any impact, I hope it can help raise awareness and so that you can collectively feel proud of these things that help make this, uh, this place have a sense of place, be identifiably a Florida city, because these kind of hex pavers are more typical of Florida than anywhere else. Uh, it seems like southern cities also seem to, tended to uh, lean towards these obelisks. And if there are any more bricks hiding under, con under asphalt, maybe preserve them too. So I mentioned my website, and I don't know if my wife has uh, I left my card for my website. Uh, it's at the back, so as you exit, please help yourself to a card. I have a website where I've been documenting a start payment. In fact, that's how Sal found me. I got an email, which was actually sent through the website, which was a first. Uh, I was like, wow, I didn't know it worked that way. Because my email address is in there, but he sent it through the website as a submit form. And uh, I was delighted to get this invitation. Uh, I'm in the process of well, Squarespace has introduced a whole new format. It's like, oh no. And so um, about one quarter of my research is currently online. So when you go in to the cities, uh, I think I have like 13, 14, 15 cities. I've been to over 50 now, and now I can add Fernandina Beach to that list. It also works on your phone. So this is the, what it looks like on your phone, it has all the same uh, navigability, you can visit via city, or you can go say, I want to look at other cities with this kind of pavement, or sidewalks, or the embedded features. So, and if you wish to reach out to me, also on my card is my email address. So thank you for your attention, and I hope you are successful in persuading civic officials that these elements of your city, you don't want your city to look like Abercorn south of Duran with all of the character-defining features removed for the sake of smooth, um, litigation-free, uh, uh, <laughs> trust me, Savannah has highly, much more irregular sidewalks than you, and they've got, you know, use these steps at your own risk signs here and there, and, but, um, you know, there are a lot of irregular, places with irregular surfaces don't let that be the only reason why uh, your city officials think that, uh, or the Florida DOT. I don't know what, what uh, recourse you have against them, but anyway, maybe a lot of voices might make a difference. So thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. So I understand that New hex pavers are substantially thicker or more robust than the originals that we have. Um, is that your understanding? And do you know what their underlying base is? Or what, what are they laid on? Um, actually, if you go to the, I don't know if I can get back there fast enough, but the ones in Ybor City, that the website where I found that information, they actually go into that. They literally tell you it's an, uh, I think it's like an eight inch base of a certain kind of compacted sand, and they, they get very specific about the kind of sand, and they tell you the recipe of the concrete, and because they have two tones, they, the website explains how they mixed different materials into their, um, yeah, in here, this company, if you go to their website, Classic Hex Pavers, and um, they've been constant requests for them, commits manufacturing them again, we stockpile all colors. They don't look significantly thicker. They might be, I mean, the historic ones are probably two inches, and these ones maybe at most are three or two and a half. They look slightly thicker, but not significantly. Um, but this site, there are other pages, and they go into the details. So if you look them up, Carol's Building Materials, in, I don't know where they're based, they're probably in Tampa. Yeah, they're serving all the neighborhoods around Tampa, but, um, 
but they're definitely in production and they talked about how they, the process, so it's really good detail there. Yes, ma'am. The original papers that you were, that piqued your interest, what was the reason for that, for the triangle? The oh, in Savannah, the so in front of my building, yes. there's a street, it's a T-shaped intersection, and in that intersection was a triangle, it's actually on the park. So because that's where my, um, my research began. So just visualize a triangle of pavement. That's the, sort of my logo, as it were. And um, I actually have a TED Talk on YouTube. So if you Google my name and pavement, I'm the only one with my name and pavement, uh, <laughs> you will find that TED Talk on YouTube. And I mentioned in that um, talk, which is a 13-minute TEDx talk in Savannah, that about pavement, and that um, I was curious. and. My first instinct was that it was a yield sign because you, you know, you're programmed as a driver, a triangle is yield. And I thought, wow, that would make sense. It's an intersection and there used to be two-way traffic because now it's all one way around the squares but there used to be two-way traffic and I thought, well, that might make sense. And I saw this eminent urban historian was in Savannah, a uh, guy named John Reps from Cornell University. And he was in Savannah. He's written multiple books. He's since passed away, but he's written most of important books in the history of American cities. I said, John, I want to show you something. I took him outside, showed him a triangle, and said, what do you think this was about? He goes, I have never seen one of those before. I bet it's interesting. And so, and then, and I'm going to guess, are you a municipal engineer by any chance? At the back, I saw you, at the, you in the blue. No? OK. Um, what's that? Oh, kind of. OK. Uh, I think I saw you earlier today. At the courthouse, yes. Okay. And you were looking at me like, who's that guy taking pictures of the sidewalk? <laughs> and um, I get a lot of that when I'm out there taking pictures, especially in the middle of the road. And um, so anyway, I asked a municipal engineer in Savannah, and around the same time I found a historic paving book from the 19, early 1900s. And so around the same time, from two separate sources, I discovered that the reason you angle the bricks into a triangle so the bricks are laid like these planks, perpendicular to the flow of traffic, so that the wheel crosses multiple bricks at a time. But when you're curving in an intersection, you have to rotate the bricks 45 degrees, so as your wheels turn, the bricks are angled, and when you come into a full turn, then the adjacent street has its bricks going in a different direction. So you can see this, uh, if we go back through to vitrified brick pavement, um, so you can see it here, there's that diagonal pattern, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're laid this way, then they turn, and then they're laid that way. And so that's very common in intersections, except Savannah is a, has a lot of T intersections, so it's only half of that. Instead of it being a big X, it's just a triangle. Sorry, long-winded answer, <laughs> but it was enough for me to go, wow, that's a really fascinating pattern. They're all over downtown Savannah. Any other? Yes, sir. Um, well, when I was growing up in the Northeast, there was a lot of Belgian blocks. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone's, the, the, through the wintertime, the asphalt would uh, get the, worn away and you could see it. And they, you know, in the springtime, they'd fill it in. And it, 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 I always wondered why they didn't just keep the Belgian block because it, it, it just it, it stayed. It, yep. was, it was still there. Oops. And the asphalt. Okay. Yeah, so the question is, in case you couldn't hear it, uh, why in northern cities they had a lot of Belgian blocks, usually made of granite, why would they cover them with asphalt? And then with the free th thaw cycles, it peels off and then the Belgian blocks would be revealed and then they go back and put a new layer of asphalt on it. Uh, when I grew up in Toronto, the streetcar tracks, and Toronto still has a streetcar system, and between the tracks was Belgian blocks. To either side of the tracks was asphalt. And so, and I can tell you from the, just the experience of my dad always trying to line up his wheels on the track. <laughs> so he didn't have to, I think it's just the, the surface is more irregular and drivers want to go fast and bumpy materials tend to slow drivers down, which is precisely why the historic pavements are helpful because they're traffic calm. And, and nowhere do people drive slower in Savannah than on River Street, which is the bumpiest pavement. And they go 10 or 15 miles per hour, and it's um, 
which makes it much safer for pedestrians. And an area that's restoring, heavily restoring all of its Belgian block streets is the Dumbo section of Brooklyn. So it's the area near the old Navy Yards, this industrial area, not far from, it's under the Manhattan Bridge. So if you're familiar with New York City, there's the Brooklyn Bridge, then the Manhattan Bridge to its north, and Dumbo is down under the Manhattan Bridge. And that's where it gets its name as a district. It has, my, I don't know if about miles, but many, many blocks of granite streets. And um, anywhere you have an old industrial area, you'd have granite, like River Street, Savannah. So my guess is they're bumpy, and people like smooth. And, uh, but granite, in, it's indestructible. I mean, it's astonishing. And even vitrified bricks. Um, Savannah has Jones Street that looks like this. The last time they paved it was like 1895. Mm. So this is my argument to city municipal engineers. It's like, you go with asphalt, you are committing to repaving every 10 to 15 years, especially as it gets hotter. Mm. What was the heat index today in Savannah? So in Savannah, the heat index, it was 97 or something, but the heat index, we have a meteorologist that lives around the corner from us, and he's been posting what the heat index has been lately. Um, yeah, well over one, I don't know how long asphalt can, I mean, it, you're, it's like that toaster thing, right? It's going to get soft, it'll, it'll deform. So maybe increasing heat will persuade people to go back to these kind of materials. <laughs> Who knows? Any other questions? So lobby your politicians, poke the Florida DOT bear, and, and tell them you want a, a more comprehensive assessment of this situation. Yes, sir. Um, with respect to uh, lobbying your politicians to have them seek benefits or uh, undertaking these efforts, what have you found to be the most persuasive arguments to get municipal officials to want to do this? Well, I, imagine, you know, there's I haven't quite got there yet in Savannah, but I am interested in other, I think in some places, uh, the pavement is their most palpable piece of heritage, right. where even more than their buildings, they've got good surviving pavement, like places that are younger, like St. Petersburg, is a young city. And so for them, this is, you know, they don't have hundreds of years of history, even as much as Fernandita Beach has. And uh, so for them, I think part of it is, uh, it is an integral part of their heritage and they want to protect it. I think the, so for some places, traffic calming makes sense. Heritage, um, some cities, New York City, uh, even though we equate it as a city that's absolutely crazy about new development is probably at the forefront of going into like the old meatpacking district and Soho and Dumbo and they have been doing amazing preservation work and working with the Americans with Disabilities Act and trying to reconcile how do you have an old pavement like Belgian blocks and so they're getting new granite crosswalks and finding a way or cyclists who want smooth paths and historic and you know, people want heritage so New York is a great um, sort of petri dish for all of this. But I'd say heritage is a big one. And then the other traffic calming, um, these materials do allow a little bit of permeability. Um, and the fact that you're not going to have to repave it every 15 years. So in the, it's, in the short term, it's more expensive. So it's, it's a long-term investment, which a lot of municipal politicians want the uh, the shorter term fix rather than longer term fix. But you're talking about some things that are certainly not. Yep, like thank you. Long term, you know, this is going to be in terms of tourism. You're actually talking about. Well, and tourism, yeah. yes, absolutely. That's enough. That's part of the heritage right, equation, but, right? You're also talking about some things that are much more sort of like tangible, concrete, right? Concrete, but and you know, that you, could, you know, you're talking about things that could be more appealing to people who are thinking short term in terms of like. Yeah, so I would say on the short-term front, maintenance might be one. Um, you know, as I was mentioning with asphalt, it might not be as durable as it used to be. But I'd say heritage, and when you think of how important 
in is tourism to Fernandina Beach, yeah, right. and if all your sidewalks just end up becoming concrete, yeah. even stamp tax concrete is not the same thing right. as the real deal, especially if you carry on with the tradition of multi-patterns. Right. And uh, um, so it doesn't have to be, just like historic buildings, there is a tradition if, especially with wooden architecture, and when I was on the review board in Savannah, if a uh, historic building had rotting wood, we would replace it in kind, right? It's still an historic building, but the cladding material or the windows, or if something rots, you replace it. The roof, you replace. And I think we need to think about civic infrastructure as, you know, if your sidewalks are all cracked, but there's a manufacturer of hex papers, you replace them in kind. You're preserving the tradition and not get so fixated on saying, well, we got to save even every cracked piece. Obviously, that's a hazard to the public safety. So, finding that balance between public safety and heritage. Well, thank you all. Appreciate the uh, questions. And please help yourself to my card at the back. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.